I will begin the recording. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the California Board of Accountancy's Chair Vice Chair Training. Why don't we do some introductions by having Ms. Reed do a roll call? Good afternoon. Um, Mark Silverman. Michael Savoy. Michael Savoy present. Yen Tu. Ariel Pei. Present. Soshi Leon. Dan Jacobson. Dee Dee Owens. Dee Dee Owens present. Doug Aguilera. Present. Kathy Johnson. Jeff Delizer. Jeff Delizer present. Laura Ross. Michael Williams. Timothy Jones. Jim Jones, present. And Helen, Helen Joffrey. Joffrey. And Joffrey. Thanks. All right. Sorry about that, Helen. And that concludes my um, roll call. I'm sorry. I had connection issues. This is Nancy Corrigan, so I am present. <clears throat> all right. Thank you all for being here today. This meeting is being held to assist the chairs and the vice chairs in their leadership role and to share information for those who are considering a leadership role in the future. During today's meeting, Ms. Bowers, DCA Legal Counsel, and I will be discussing various topics, including the roles and expectations of committee members, the chair and vice chairs, how to conduct a meeting in accordance with the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act, how to handle contact from consumers or licensees, and CBA staff roles to support you in your positions. We will also hear from one current committee chair and one former committee chair and CBA president and past presidents regarding their insights of being in a leadership role. I would like to thank each of you for serving in a leadership capacity. Your service to the board, consumers, applicants, and licensees is extremely valuable as you guide your particular committees in achieving its purpose, which ultimately impacts the CBA's mission of consumer protection. Each of you have a valuable role with the California Board of Accountancy, whether you are on a committee, a board member, or serve as a chair or vice chair of any of the CBA committees. In any of these roles, it is important that you have an understanding of my expectations so that the committee functions effectively and in accordance with the various laws that govern meetings. More importantly, it's important so that the committee can assist the CBA in meeting its consumer protection mission. We have two types of committees. Statutory committees include the Enforcement Advisory Committee, the Qualifications Committee, and the Peer Review Oversight Committee. We have the CBA Standing Committees, which consist of the Committee on Professional Conduct, the Enforcement Program Oversight Committee, and the Legislative Committee. Regardless of the type of committee, attendance and participation at these meetings is critical. The committee establishes dates nearly a year in advance to provide ample time for planning. When members don't attend, it can impact the committee's ability to meet 
if a quorum is not present, and also impact the committee's ability to conduct applicant interviews or investigative hearings. Similarly, important is your participation. The reason each of you were selected to serve as a member or in a leadership role was based on your skills and knowledge and with the belief that you will interact and share your individual and invaluable ex expertise. It is okay to ask questions, share your ideas, and request information. This is all part of serving and actively participating on a committee. For the chair and vice chair responsibilities. The chair of the statutory committees is responsible for ensuring that members of the committee understand the importance of good attendance and active participation during the meetings. Any attendance, participation, or performance issues should be addressed first by the chair and then brought to the division chief and the executive officer's attention. Mark Silverman, the vice president of the CBA, will also be communicating with the chairs of all the statutory committees to ensure that each member who is being considered for appointment or for reappointment understands the attendance and participation expectations. As a chair or vice chair in their absence, you are tasked with running the meeting and are ultimately responsible for ensuring that the agenda is followed and members participate in accordance with the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. The CBA's legal counsel will discuss this more in depth in a few minutes. The chair and vice chair are also expected to attend CBA meetings. This is beneficial to the CBA so that they can keep apprised of committee activities, but also to chair and vice chair so they are aware of the policy discussions and priorities of the CBA. As you are likely already aware, all CBA and committee members must complete various training courses. The legally required training typically must be done within a specific time frame. Staff monitor the training requirements and provide members with all the information necessary to complete this training. If members are not responsive to CBA staff regarding the completion of training, the chair or vice chair in their absence will be asked to work with that member on gaining compliance. To the CBA liaisons, I have appointed CBA liaisons to the Qualifications Committee, Enforcement Advisory Committee, and the Peer Review Oversight Committee. The liaison will be there to provide information to the committee regarding the various activities and actions that have been taken at the board level, as well as give any direction or assignments to the committee. The liaisons and the chairs are critical to ensuring continued communication between the committee and the board. That includes my opening remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have so far, and also have the staff available to answer to any of your questions. So at this point, please raise your hand so I can see if you have any questions. So far, so good. I'd like to open it up to the public to see if there's any public comments regarding my opening comments. Open the Q&A panel. If you'd like to make a comment on this part, please click on the Q&A icon on your screen, type comment into the text field and submit that to our panelists. not seeing any requests i will close the panel thank you moving on to item number three miss joffrey thank you sorry i was muted uh my name is helen joffrey and i'm here from the department of consumer affairs legal affairs division and i serve as board counsel for the cba I'm here to do a presentation for training. Uh, do you have my PowerPoint available? 
Thank you. Go ahead and next slide. So when we do the training and in general, these are the references that we will be discussing. The Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act is a provision of law set forth in the government code and applies to most meetings throughout the state of California. The Accountancy Act is the specific law that is the jurisdiction of the California Board of Accountancy and is located in the Business and Professions Code. Uh, you can ask for any of these resources to be provided to you, either by a link or by copy. Uh, and you can also ask for a copy of this PowerPoint if you would like. Next slide. State policy dictates the Bagley Keene Act. It's the state policy that we exist to conduct the people's business. And because we are conducting the people's business, we need to allow the public to participate and be aware of what the public's business consists of and where it's going. Next slide. So in delegating authority uh, for as representation, the people do not give up the right to decide what is good for them to know and what is not good for them to know. And so this is the cornerstone of the Open Meeting Act. It is to remain open unless specifically authorized to be conducted in a closed session setting. Otherwise, all communications, voting, information that is provided to the board uh, must be provided to the public and the public given the opportunity to comment and make uh, suggestions, ideas, uh, or other, um, or ask other questions. Next slide. Compliance with Bagley Keene is required. Uh, violations of Bagley Keene is subject to civil lawsuits and individual members can be held accountable uh, via a misdemeanor. Next slide. The three main duties of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act is that proper notice is provided to the public of the meetings themselves and the items that may be discussed, that the uh, meetings be conducted in open session unless otherwise specifically authorized and that the public give, be given an opportunity to comment. This allows the public to fully participate in the public's business. For the purposes of committees and board members, the proper notice is mainly handled by the staff. The conduct of the meetings is kind of a shared responsibility between the staff and the board and uh, committee members. And then, of course, provide opportunity to, pub to provide public comment is uh, during the meeting and is very much controlled by the board members and committee members. Next slide. Do we have any questions at all regarding uh, the introductory policy and overall concepts of Bagley Keene? Do we have members of the public that are not uh, promoted and would need the public comment section? We currently have uh, our webcaster and then a representative from DCA connected. Okay, uh, the representative of DCA. Um, let's open it up for public comment to see if that person would like to make public comment and if they would like to waive future public comment or if we would like to open it up at each question. All right, give me one moment. All right, our Q&A panel is open. If uh, any of our current attendees would like to make a comment, please click on that Q&A icon, type the word comment or the phrase I would like to make a comment into the text field and submit that to our panelists. Not seeing any requests, I will close the panel. Okay. And there are a few points uh, where, I, where I will be pausing for questions. And so we can see if um, if anyone has either joined us or would like to make comment who are not promoted to panelists. 
Okay, the next subject is meetings. Next slide. So when is a meeting a meeting? A meeting is a majority of the members of a state body that gather at the same time to hear, discuss, or deliberate upon any item. Um, and as I stated, this provision, uh, the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act applies to almost every meeting within the state of California. There's also a federal um, option, uh, and there's also the Brown Act, uh, which I believe is the federal option. So almost all meetings are conducted very similarly, uh, but this is the overall concept of a meeting for the purposes of meetings within California. Next slide. A meeting also includes what's called a series of communications. So the definition stated that when they gather, they are uh, discussing. Well, that's going to include even if they don't directly gather, but they attempt to make, uh, members attempt to communicate or deliberate or to poll ideas, et cetera, either through intermediaries or through texting, telephone calls. This would include uh, calling, say, for example, myself, board counsel, or the executive officer, and asking that person to communicate with the other board members or the other committee members. All of that needs to take place in front of the public as the public's business. So this is a meeting, and therefore, if this is how it needs, if this is how it chooses to be conducted, it must be conducted in the public's eye. Next slide. When is a meeting not a meeting? When, as in this situation, we do have the attendance of a majority of the members of a committee or a board um, that is open to the public and involves a discussion of general interest, or uh, when the attendance of the majority of members is at a purely social or ceremonial occasion as long as the majority of members do not discuss issues under their jurisdiction. So um, even if it is a purely social or ceremonial occasion, the board members may not discuss any issues uh, or poll each other for any questions or potential regulations or anything regarding the Accountancy Act or anything related to the practice of accountancy. Next slide. This is titled, when is a meeting not a meeting? And this is, when is there not a meeting within a, me a meeting? So at committee mem uh, meetings, you will note that some of the members will be board members. That is appropriate and that is fine as long as there's not a majority of members who are serving on the committee because then that becomes a board meeting and that is closely monitored. However, board members may come and observe as long as those members that are not on the committee are simply observing, so they cannot be asked questions, they cannot ask questions, uh, they cannot interject or anything of that nature, they are simply observing, then this remains a committee meeting and not a board meeting. Once the members, um, once we have a majority of board members who are contributing, this becomes a board meeting and should have been um, noticed as such. Next slide. So what is a quorum? A quorum is the minimum number of members that must be present for business to be legally transacted. If a quorum does not exist, the board may not make any uh, decisions uh, or, or take votes or whatnot to conduct the business because a quorum is not present. This will be addressed a little better in uh, the section on voting. But a quorum for the meeting permits legally transactable business. But when voting on a, on a motion, it's only the majority of members who are entitled to vote. Uh, so it, it does get a little confusing as to where majority lies. But for the purposes of meetings, a quorum is, is the minimum number of members who must be present to conduct business. Next slide. For the Accountancy Act, the Business and Professions Code requires that a CBA board meeting is a majority of the board. The CBA board has 15 seats and a majority is more than one half. So eight members of the CBA board cons uh, constitutes a quorum. 
For a committee meeting, that number may fluctuate depending upon how many are appointed to a committee. And at that point, it's simply the majority of those that were appointed or the positions created. If it's a three member committee, two must be present. If it's a 10 member committee, six must be present. Uh, as we discussed, a, uh, a non board meeting can become a board meeting. If there are seven board meters meetings, excuse me, seven board members present. Um, uh, I do apologize because more than seven equals a quorum. To protect and to confirm that we have a quorum, it is suggested that a quorum is established at the beginning of each meeting, which it is, and that we keep track of who is actually present at the meeting for each item. In person, this is not so much of a concern because you can easily see whether or not a board member has left the room or if we are no longer at a quorum. Uh, online, the staff is very diligent, especially when we are very close to uh, maintaining a quorum to make sure that members do not fall off or out of the meeting, and those are not as, as noticeable as they would be in person. And so if the uh, quorum of the meeting does not exist, then business cannot be transacted, transacted, and we will wait for a member to return so that we again have quorum. Next slide. Does anyone have any questions on what is a meeting? What is quorum? It's Joe Free. <laughs> Thank you. And do we have anyone in the public setting? Still our same two members. And the DCA representative did not comment as to whether or not he or she would like to just wave uh, the option of public comment? I did not give them that option when I uh, opened it. So let me open it and okay. give them that option. Um, Helen, how would you like them to do that just to indicate wave in the Q&A box? Would that be Correct. sufficient? So wave, wave future public comment or um, nothing at all, or um, ask for to make a comment and then state it verbally. Okay. State what they would like verbally. So for our members in the attendee panel, if you would like to waive any future comments, if you could indicate that in the Q&A panel. Okay, our one uh, our mem member attending um, has indicated that they are fine with waiving their future comments. Okay, sounds great. I will, however, check at each point to make sure uh, no one else has joined us or I would like to make a comment or a panelist has fallen out and is now an attendee. Okay. Okay, proper notice. Next slide. As uh, you may remember, proper notice is a duty of a public body in order to provide notice to the public that business their business is being conducted. An agenda for all meetings is required, and an agenda must contain a brief description of the items of business to be transacted or discussed, and it doesn't need to be paragraphs long, but it so it doesn't need to exceed 20 words, uh, and that is actually provided in the law. Um, it is intended to not require the public to conduct guesswork or to ask further questions on what exactly is going to be conducted at the meeting. These two items are mainly handled by staff. Um, however, of course, board and committee members are welcome to review and to confirm that proper notice has been um, provided. Of most interest to board members in the committee is the provision that no item may be added to the agenda after notice unless specifically permitted by law. If there is notice given in advance, uh, which we will discuss in a moment, but beyond um, 10 days, some items may be added to the agenda. But once there is the basic minimum of, of notice, nothing further can be added. Next slide. So this is mainly, again, a question for staff, but uh, we welcome the board members and committee members to also test themselves. 
but when the uh, agenda is published, you can ask yourself, is the item specific enough for a member of the public to reasonably understand what is to be conducted at that meeting? Agenda items uh, are specifically reviewed internally by CBA staff and also approved by legal prior to being published. Next slide. So written notice of meetings must be provided 10 days before the meeting. Members who or people of the public who would like to have a specific agenda provided to them can ask for it to be done by mail, email, both, however the requester prefers it. And the public at, at large is provided notice by posting on the internet 10 days prior to a meeting. And of course, all of this is done by staff. Um, and this is more for your information. And of course, if you have any questions, you can ask staff. Next slide. So, and I do apologize, that was for regular meetings. There are three types of meetings and regular meetings are 99.9% .9 of the type of meetings that CBA will encounter um, and particular committee uh, meetings. So, however, the bagley Keene Act, again, applies to all state bodies. And so there are other provisions for uh, emergencies or specific types of situations. One of them is a special meeting. A special meeting can be called by the providing, excuse me, presiding officer or two board members. It still must comply with the 10 day notice for posting or if it would provide a substantial hardship or immediate action is required, there is a, a alternative provision. For a special meeting, at the beginning of the meeting, the board must make findings and vote on the fact that this does indeed meet the requirements of special meeting and that this is appropriate for a special meeting as opposed to a regular meeting. Next slide. When a hardship is present uh, or there is an, uh, an urgent need to hold a special meeting, notice may be provided 48 hours in advance. And essentially the entire world needs to know. It needs to go out to the National Press Wire services to be produced in newspapers, general circulation of general circulation, radio and television stations. It must also be posted on the internet. There is a list of reasons to hold special meetings Two that are most common are to consider pending litigation and proposed legislation. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, next slide. Finally, there are emergency meetings. The same provisions apply. Generally, if you can provide 10 days of notice, it's probably not an emergency meeting. It's more of a special meeting or regular meeting. However, more notice is always better, but the minimum is a one hour notice. And again, this needs to go out to general circulation, paper, radio, television, and internet. Uh, as with a special meeting, a finding of the emergency situation must be made by a majority of the members prior to uh, beginning the emergency meeting. The government code provides two um, options or two, two basis for an emergency situation, which would be work stoppage uh, or other activity that impairs the public health safety or both, or a crippling disaster that impairs public safe, healthy, uh, health, safe, I apologize, public health, safety, or both. There is a rule for counting days. Again, majority of this is handled by the staff, but of course, board members and committee members are always welcome to confirm uh, but to count the days for notice so for regular meetings 10 days for special meetings uh, 48 hours it is excluding the first day and including the last when it comes down to hours it would follow the same pattern excluding the first hour including the last next slide so meetings can be held uh, via teleconference and in person, and now currently webcast. Uh, we are, were conducting webcasts prior to the pandemic, uh, but um, and it followed the same patterns as a teleconference. Many of these provisions are provisions of law, but are currently waived uh, as a matter of law through January 31st, and as a matter of the 
executive order uh, through March 31st of 2022. So currently these are active laws just simply being waived. And so we did wanna make sure that you were aware of them. Uh, executive officer Patty, uh, please feel free to join in if there's anything that I've missed. I have not been a member with CBA um, since before the pandemic. So I've only had the experience of webcast. So she may have some insights that I don't have. But essentially, uh, as we know, a webcast or teleconference, members can be at different locations, but they're connected through electronic means. And one member must be physically present at every noticed location, which is currently waived. They must attend a publicly noticed location. They cannot attend a private location or to refuse to publicize their location, also waived. And additional locations may be uh, provided where a staff location is recommended. So, and CBA does require that a roll call vote be required for all of its uh, voting. However, in this particular instance, the law does require the roll call vote. Next slide. So proper notice for the webcast or teleconference meetings are the exact same as a in-person meeting with the exception that is currently waived of posting all the teleconference locations. Next slide. So for teleconference meetings, there are times when a panelist conference call number or passcode is provided so that uh, you can go into closed session. Sometimes an alternative link may be provided so you can go into closed session. That is to be rem to remain confidential, especially on teleconference meetings over the phone where it's difficult to see if someone joined. Uh, so if that occurs, that is uh, important. However, currently we just uh, handle that through uh, WebEx and are able to manage that without separate conference call numbers and passcodes. Um, and as we said, uh, take roll call and uh, notice locations where staff is present. Both of, uh, the roll call before a meeting is always a good tip, <laughs> but both of these are waived uh, as well as the announce of the location is waived um, currently. Next slide. ADA compliance. All uh, public meetings must be accessible and materials uh, that were provided at or before the meeting and meeting notice must be done in ADA compliant fashion upon the request of someone with a disability. Staff will handle this and uh, however, just so that you are aware or if you have any, if you are asked any questions, the notice and agenda that are posted on the website are automatically and always ADA compliant. Next slide. So this is not exactly waived, but not exactly relevant during the time of um, teleconference and webcast meetings. But generally at the meeting, if meeting materials were prepared by staff or were otherwise received prior to the meeting, they must be distributed at the meeting. And after the meeting, if materials were provided during the meeting, they must now be provided uh, to the public after the meeting. The purpose of this is that the public is always granted the opportunity to review all materials that the board or the committee reviewed. Next slide. Any questions on proper notice of a meeting and, and uh, the public's ability to receive comment or to, to participate? Okay. Oh, I do apologize. Can we check to see if anyone has been added to the public uh, attendees list? No additional public members. Thank you. Okay, open session, the hot seat. General rules. Uh, this shouldn't be a surprise. All meetings are public unless specifically authorized. The meetings provide the public the opportunity to address the board on each item. And all discussions, all votes must be taken publicly, nothing secret, nothing um, substituted, always in the public, always protecting the public's ability to participate in their business. Next slide. Facilitating a discussion. 
This is a general guideline of how it would flow, especially in a, in a perfect world. Uh, the agenda item would be called. The party that is presenting the item would present. There would be discussion, and discussion may include public discussion as well as board discussion. Then a motion is requested, a second is requested, or simply made. It says ask for a motion, but during the discussion, one can make a motion. It does need to be seconded, as we saw today. A second is not needed if the motion is from a board committee. Ask for board and committee discussion on the motion. Ask for public comment. See if there's any further discussion. It is recommended to repeat the motion before uh, the vote. Do a vote by roll call and announce whether the motion has carried or failed. Next slide. Motions. What is a motion? It is a proposal of a decision or action. It must be seconded, unless there's that exception. And then the president or chair restates the motion for clarity. It is moved and seconded that. If the motion is vague, it can be amended or clarified or restated. If it is changed after a second, the second must concur with the changes. Uh, so the motion would be changed by the original mover, but then the second must also concur to the changes. If the second does not concur, a new second is required. Once the motion is made and seconded, a vote shall be made on the motion unless it's withdrawn. Um, the motion and the discussion cannot stand alone uh, as to this is what the board wishes. The vote must be taken because the board will vote or the committee will vote as a single voice rather than the individual communications. So when a motion is made and seconded, a vote shall commence eventually. Next slide. Ending debate. A uh, debate tends to fade out on its own or become slower or um, otherwise begin to, to terminate, but to make sure that everyone had the opportunity um, the chair or the president would ask for final comments from the member, ask for public comment, and confirm that there is no further discussion, call for the vote. If discussion is becoming circular or lengthy or endless, uh, there is a method to halt discussion by requesting to halt the discussion. This becomes, for clarity, a request within the motion because simply asking to call for the question or to move to the previous question does not automatically uh, deny the rest of the board or committee the opportunity to discuss. Instead, discussion halts. It needs to be seconded. No second, we pursue with uh, discussion. If it is seconded, ask for public comment and then vote on the request to halt discussion. If it's adopted, the board then immediately moves to vote on the motion at hand. If it is denied, discussion pen, uh, resumes. However, there's, there's so the indications of this is that there's no need for permanent discussion and um, um, no end in sight. There are options. Next slide, thank you. Counting votes. When you vote, you have the option to vote in favor, to oppose, or to abstain. They must be done in open session via roll call and a majority is the amount of the majority decision is the majority of the votes actually cast and abstains and um, what is the word recusals do not count as a vote cast. You'll see below that it cites an op opinion of the attorney general. In that particular case, there was a city council meeting in which there were four members present, they did have a quorum. When they voted on a matter, two abstained, two approved. And so the attorney general was asked to opine if the meeting did indeed, or they, the motion did indeed pass. The attorney general said, yes, it had. Of the two valid votes, there was a majority in favor, therefore it passed. So it's not a matter of the quorum of the board seats that has to pass, but a majority of those voting. There are laws if things become an issue. Uh, for example, everyone feels that they cannot cast a non-biased vote. 
uh, and that will be dealt with at the time. But otherwise, this is how the people's business is conducted. If there is an issue, and this does happen with brand new boards or brand new commissions, where there is a matter that it requires uh, the people's business to be completed, uh, specifically if there is a decision on, say, discipline or minutes, the people's business does need to pursue. So if everyone abstains, and there's a reason for the abstention, most likely I don't have enough information, I didn't receive this document, I didn't do this. Um, the board or committee then needs to advise staff how they can become knowledgeable in order to conduct the people's business. Do they need to watch the prior meeting? Do they need more time to review the documents? Do they need more information? What can be done in order to allow the board or commission to conduct the people's business? Next, look, excuse me, next slide. And this isn't exactly how it looks, but uh, when it goes on the minutes, uh, those who voted yes, those who voted no, and those who abstained will be documented. Next step, public comment. As you may remember, public comment and allowing the public to participate is a cornerstone of the Bagley Keene Act. Public comment must be allowed before or during the board's discussion or sorry, committee's discussion or consideration before a vote. Uh, there is an exception. In general, the public have the right to participate and make a comment. Next slide. So public comment must be permitted before, during, or after each agenda item. When in doubt, ask for public comment. This is specifically um, critical for the board members and committee members to note during webcast and teleconference meetings. In a live meeting, you'll be able to see if the public is even present to make a comment or if members of the public are lining up to uh, the microphone to ask a question, are raising their hands, somehow indicating that there's a way to conduct public comment on a a webcast or a telephonic meeting, there's no means for the public to communicate to the board or the committee that uh, they wish to make a comment. So it is important that the board and committee remain diligent to ask for com public comment to make sure that all opportunities are being provided. That being said, the president or chair may set reasonable time limitations. CBA is authorized to set a regulation. It's not yet chosen to do so. However, we do announce on the notice of time limits that are presented. Also, uh, this can be announced at the meeting itself. And of course, if a member of the public is using a translator, they get twice the allotted time. That's only fair. Um, and the president or chair can conduct um, public comment as reasonably necessary to make sure people have a reasonable amount of time to comment. Next slide. So public comments for items not on the agenda. We take a slot of time uh, during the meeting to offer the public an opportunity to make any comments, questions, suggestions of something that is not on the agenda. The board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised that's not on the agenda, with the exception of deciding as a board whether or not to place this matter on the agenda. That is not mandatory. The president or the chair can on their own decide to place this on the agenda. Um, this may be a good idea for um, uh, minor issues. However, if the board or committee um, have issues or would like to make it uh, formal, they can vote and decide on whether to place the matter on the agenda and discussion would be limited strictly to whether or not it is an appropriate matter for the future agenda meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me again. So in order to ensure that uh, no uh, discussion is taking place that is not on the agenda. It is very recommended that you study the agenda in advance. Also, you can cut off members of the public or specifically members of the board when they appear to deviate from the agenda item. So if a member of the public were to make a comment that they believe the Board of Accountancy should be involved with deciding how many apples should be at the store, 
the board can simply smile and say thank you for your comment. If in the middle of a full discussion, they begin to give all the reasons, then the uh, public member can be asked to refrain and only speak on either matters of the agenda or to allow the board to determine whether or not this should be a matter, matter of the agenda. But a majority of the time it is, um, or it could be a member of either the board or the committee that is going beyond the scope or asking questions or, um, entertain or discussing items that are not currently on the agenda. Next slide. So if the board would like to discuss, the president or chair may refer the matter to place it on the future agenda. And as we discussed, the board could place it on the agenda. Also, occasionally the member of the public has a question that can actually be directed to the, to the staff or the executive officer. For example, if someone were to question, I cannot find the uh, CBA requirements to become a CPA on the website, then instead of placing this on an agenda, this can be uh, referred to a staff member. Next slide. Disorderly conduct. Bagley Keene does provide that willful interruption that renders orderly conduct uh, impossible uh, is permitted to um, be handled. Uh, it's not the intent of Bagley Keene for uh, disorder and, and a meeting to be unable to be continued. We do need to conduct the people's business. Next slide. What can you do about it? The board cannot prevent criticism and must always be sensitive that the public member has a right to comment. If, for example, there is a common commenter or um, a commenter that, that tends to be rude, that commenter is still allowed the opportunity and right to comment. Um, their comment, after they're given the right, may be otherwise um, handled, but uh, everyone has a right to comment and everyone has a right to provide criticism of the board as long as it remains proper because the board or the committee must also maintain order. In order to do so, they can take steps to protect the public meeting from personal, impertinent, slanderous, or profane comments. Next slide. Uh, ways to handle this. Uh, I tried to put this in order of um, escalation. You can request the person to speak slowly and refrain from using inappropriate language. You could also ask that they calm down, but that tends to have the opposite effect. So I suggested speak slowly. Um, if the person continues, you can request that the person stop the disruptive behavior, ask that that person leave the room, for the purposes of the webcast, you can also ask for the mic to be cut off, <coughs> excuse me, or you could research recess the meeting in person until law enforcement can be secured or recess the meeting until we can secure the person um, on the webcast and otherwise um, either remove them or handle the situation. Next slide. So in addition to disruptive persons, we sometimes have technical disruptions. So it is not uncommon, of course, that webcast meetings or teleconferences may encounter technical difficulties. Remain calm and confident. You may confer with staff publicly that the issue is being resolved. You can also suggest that we take a recess while the problem is being addressed. If there are long periods of pauses, it is recommended to announce uh, occasionally to the public the reason for the pauses. Next slide. Technical disruptions can also um, occur on a private level. Uh, so you can encounter uh, issues at your particular location or with your con particular connection. So to work within that, you want to have a staff member contact information so that you can call or email for assistance as soon as possible. It also assists to uh, attend web platform practice sessions where certain things can be discussed and, and uh, tips can be provided. You should know how to call into a meeting if web service becomes unavailable. Or you can advise staff or the members publicly if there's an issue at the meeting itself, including the inability to hear. So that's probably the most common. Um, also, if a slide goes up and, and you can't see it or anything like that, uh, essentially 
you're there to um, vote and discuss. And in order to do so, you need to be able to see and hear whatever needs, to, whatever is being presented. So do not be afraid to um, ask for assistance, even during a meeting or find a way to get back into the meeting using staff assistance um, if something were to happen. Next slide. Are there any questions about what we've discussed so far regarding conducting meetings, um, handling persons? Nope, just hoping that we won't have to face that situation. Right? <laughs> Closed session. Okay, closed session is allowed for very specific purposes. Mainly it's for disciplinary and enforcement matters, uh, examination issues, uh, to receive legal advice from counsel, uh, to handle the employment of the executive officer, and for the enforcement advisory committee and qualifications examination committee to interview an applicant. Outside of these reasons, uh, I believe there may be a few more, but uh, basically, if it's not on this list or it's not provided in law, you cannot have a closed session. Next slide. So in public, it's all recorded. There's uh, minutes being taken, et cetera. In closed session, that remains. So because we are still conducting the people's business, although it's not public, a minute book is required and a staff member must be present in order to record the topics discussed and the decisions made. The board or specified committee must only discuss matters on the agenda as closed session items. Next slide. So for closed session items, it must be provided on the agenda, including the legal, the legal authority or before going into closed session, the president or chair must announce an open session, the general nation, nature of the item or items to be discussed. There are certain exceptions to how much information the public can get on closed session. Specifically, the name of the licensee that's subject to discipline is generally not provided for their privacy, although an order will be, of course, issued um, for discussion purposes uh, especially if the board were to say to waive or to dismiss the case, uh, that would be awkward. And so um, their name is generally not listed. Litigation is listed. However, if it would just uh, jeopardize the ability for CBA to handle uh, litigation matters, including negotiations or notice, then that can be uh, removed. And if litigation arises uh, after the agenda is posted, remember, we cannot add anything to the agenda. So instead, the president or chair would announce an open session, the fact that litigation issues have arisen and, if possible, the name of the litigation. Next slide. Thank you. So this is just a little aside, um, just for information, because it's in the law. If uh, an executive officer employment appointment or dismissal action is being taken in closed session, the board must report on the action taken. They can either do so at the next meeting or when they reconvene into open session uh, after closed session, but before adjournment. And this would generally be because um, you would want people to know who the executive officer, who the employee of the board is or is no longer. Um, also, in general, even though it occurs in closed session, um, the results are public. So the order that is issued in discipline, the uh, determination as to whether or not you're proceeding with discipline, the litigation that occurs, even though it's not announced at public meeting, if you're following the litigation in court, you can see the ultimate decisions of the board. Um, and so final decisions are made, but this one in particular uh, requires an announcement. Next slide. Any questions on anything? And if we can double check one last time for the public. No new attendees. Okay. No questions, no comments. We are fully advised on how to hold a meeting. Okay. Thank you for your time. Please let uh, myself or a staff member know if you have any questions or would like a copy of anything that you need. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That was great. Uh, next is 
Ms. Corrigan and also Mr. Delizer reliving some personal experiences. First, Ms. Corrigan. It's a boy. And um, I think that most everybody here knows that for over 15 years, I served on all three of the CPA's advisory committees. And uh, so this would make this close to 20 years. The last three and a half years have been on the board as well. So, and during that time in the capacity of, of either being a vice chair, a chair, or secretary, treasurer, and then president, most recently, uh, my leadership experience includes client uh, meetings, firm staff meetings, other boards that I have served or do serve on, and si other situations in leadership capacity. What I want to share today are thoughts that you heard, have heard in the past and already know, but possibly just to reinforce what's important in conducting a meeting. So I'll just start. I made a few bullet points. I'd like to go through them quickly. One is know the mission of your committee and make sure your members know that as well. And it doesn't hurt to review it every so often. When I give a committee report to my board, I will often state the purpose of the committee just in the presentation so they know what the committee, like a NASBA committee, is all about. You want to stay on track with that mission and remember the ultimate goal is consumer protection. So you have your own goal within the committee, but the ultimate goal is uh, consumer protection. And the CBA, because advisory committees are appointed by the CBA, has given you kind of parameters to work within. So that's very, very important. Run an organized and controlled meeting. Know your goal for the meeting and what you expect from others. Know your agenda. That's really important. Uh, Helen pointed out some very important items just in, in her uh, process uh, today and, and the reasons for doing that. Given, you know, public meeting notice requirements are so critical. So that's kind of a given there. Set a good example and you can then expect the same from your committee. Be timely, be prepared and know your topics. Be friendly yet professional in appearance and in action. Set the tone. It's okay to have fun at meetings. Today at our board meeting, we had some chuckles here and there, but what did we do? We stayed professional and we got the job done. So that's always very important to keep in mind as a leader. Stay on topic, avoiding runaway meetings. Um, topics can always be added to future agendas if approved. And Helen stressed the importance of sticking to that agenda and not going beyond the designated boundaries. Meetings are publicly noticed and you must adhere to the agenda. Be fair and reasonable to everyone. Everyone needs to have a chance to talk and express themselves being aware of time constraints. Be ready as a leader to switch gears and politely cut off one person to move to another or cut off and move to the next agenda item. That's part of your job as the leader. We know people are talkers. We know sometimes someone on a board or a committee has their own agenda. It's your job to control that and give everybody a reasonable turn. You interject thank you and then say, I'm ready to move on now. Remember the chain of command and your reporting responsibility. We have a CBA management team. The advisory committees have a chief assigned. We have Mr. Franzell in enforcement. We have Ms. Center in licensing. And if you have issues on an advisory committee, vice chairs talk to chairs, chairs talk to those liaisons, liaisons talk to executive officer, executive officer goes to board president and so on and so on. You never go outside of that chain of command because we have important business that we are trying to conduct. Consumer uh, protection is mandated by law of California and we want to stay within that. I shouldn't come home and consult with my husband. What do I do on this, this issue? I need to consult and stay within that chain of command. I don't go to the NASBA board and talk to them about, gee, what should I do with this problem I'm having in my committee? No, I go through the chain of command. That's very, very important for many reasons and many legal reasons too. So as advisory committee leaders and as board members and board leaders, we are representatives, all of us, of the CBA. So we're selected uh, either by a board or appointed by legislative officials, and it's very important that we conduct all of our business and we are facilitated by the CBA management team. So advisory committees help us perform our work by the board, very, very importantly, with the ultimate goal of consumer protection 
And remember how visible you are. We have always been visible. We are especially visible in the virtual environment. And I imagine some combination of that will continue. So uh, very important that we do that. And uh, President Savoy, that's really all I had to say. And I just thank you for the time. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, any questions of Nancy at this time? Okay, Mr. Delizer. Thank you. Um, I will, I, I too have a, a few bullet points just to, to share some experience. Um, uh, hopefully I won't uh, repeat too much of what Nancy has said there, but there are a few things that I will kind of echo um, as the, the, I felt that they're important. Um, I have uh, served um, on both the Enforcement Advisory Committee and the Peer Review Oversight Committee um, since about 2011, um, sometimes on both committees overlapping. Um, and I've served as vice chair and chairs of both of those committees. Um, one of the things that I have found particularly helpful to me in, in these leadership roles are these training sessions. Um, I have, I, this is probably four or five that I've now attended and I pick up something in each and every one of them. Um, and so it's it's important to to pay attention to those things and utilize that as a resource. Um, the second largest resource that I've found valuable to me in these these roles is the CBA staff. They are beyond valuable to to us in in serving in our our roles uh, from from providing talking points for presentations. Um, providing helpful reminders and checklists on, uh, you know, calling for a vote and making sure that we get public comment on, on these items, as well as for coordinating communication. One of the things that we often don't think of that, that um, Helen touched on is that as we conduct the business of the committee, there's often times where we need to discuss certain things with staff or with committee members um, in between those meetings. And so it's important to let staff communicate and help us coordinate those communications so that we don't inadvertently create one of those meetings that, that kind of happens in a series through emails. And so be cautious of those things as you're, as you're conducting the business. Um, agendas are, are key in this. Uh, it's difficult sometimes as, as uh, Nancy referred to there, when a meeting starts to kind of run away and it's, it's important to, to rein that back in and guide. Those, those agendas are key. You can't discuss anything that's not on the agenda. Um, and you need to address those key points of business that you've agendized. Um, so those, those things are, are kind of areas to watch out for. Um, participation from the public is one of those areas that can kind of uh, cause a meeting to, to run for you while we do need to be constantly obtaining public comment and allowing the public to speak. There are there are schedules. There are talking points on exactly how to address that. Um, during my time as chair of the Enforcement Advisory Committee, we had we had members of the public um, arrive. There were some that were disruptive, some that were not. Um, I leaned heavily on the chief of enforcement to kind of help me guide through allowing that person time guiding the, the meeting to, to return to order and, and move forward. And so it's important to utilize those resources and lean on those. Um, in our peer review oversight committee, we have a member of the public that is a kind of a, a panelist on these virtual meetings, but is always there from the California Society of CPAs. And so it's important to kind of utilize them and let them speak and provide those resources. There are members of the public that are going to provide valuable information to this process and, and we need to allow them to participate. Um, but again, be careful as we're addressing those items and make sure that we're, we're sticking to that agenda. Um, I have found the, this process and um, being in these leadership roles to be extremely rewarding. And, and I think you know many of the people that are here in this meeting today have guided me and helped me um, throughout my time, and I appreciate um, each one of you. Thank you, Mr. Swoy. Thank you for your insights. I appreciate that. Next, Ms. Patty Bowers. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Patty Bowers, the board's executive officer. 
It's so nice to see some of our experienced committee members on today, as well as a couple new faces. And I really appreciate the board members who took the time to join us today. So as you all know, it's been a struggle recently to get some of our committee members interested in stepping up and serving in leadership positions. And then sometimes even on the board, a hesitation to step up and take those chair and vice chair roles. And in communicating with our members, I think a lot of it has to do with a hesitation to conduct the meeting. It's intimidating. You're running the meeting. You're having to answer questions. There's procedural issues and legal issues you have to follow. And so a lot of the feedback I get is just a hesitation in being, you know, wanting to do that. And especially now you add the virtual meeting you know, to the plate and that makes it even more intimidating for people. So the hope is we haven't conducted training. I'm sorry, Patty, this is the moderator. Can I apologize for the interruption. Um, let's see, we seem to be having some quality issues. Um, I know at least where I'm at, the wind has really picked up. I might recommend that perhaps the board members and committee members turn off their cameras and perhaps just leave yours on for your presentation and see if that maybe that helps with our bandwidth issues. Okay. And maybe staff as well, if you can turn off your cameras for the bandwidth as well, that would be helpful. Okay, let me just wait. Okay, so for the committee members and board members, I, I was it cutting out for you as well? I don't want to start over, but I just want to make sure I capture a couple comments. Just that last sentence. Okay, so let me let me try to think where I ended off. Let me. So uh, I think the struggle for some of our committee members wanting to step up in leadership, and our even perhaps board members wanting to take on chair and try and vice chair roles, a lot has to do with that hesitation maybe or that intimidation of conducting meetings. And now you add virtual on top of that, which makes it even a little uh, more, more of a struggle for people. So the, the hope is we haven't done this training in a couple years. So we pulled a training that was developed by the department's legal office several years ago. It predated Helen. We dusted that off. We're putting on today's training. And then with the hope that all of our members who are present, committee members, board members, staff, is to engage all of you on this training. What was useful? What was missing? What suggestions and recommendations do you have? After the training today, we're going to send out a survey to all of you asking for your honest feedback and critique and suggestions. And then ultimately, if you watch the board meeting today or you've been following some of the recent action, you know that we have some new, very talented staff on at the board who are doing some amazing work in outreach and communication, some great work with videos and podcasting. So the plan is that we'll take all of your input, all of what we have put together today, and then really revamp this training. And then once we get something exceptional together, we may even make it into a video that we can provide to new members right when they join the committee. And then also hopefully use this as a tool to encourage existing members to want to step up into these leadership roles. So that's the plan. So thank all of you. You didn't know I was volunteering you to assist us with this endeavor, but I thank all of you uh, for being on here and, and doing that. So before I jump into the agenda item, uh, which is to talk about how to handle contact from consumers and licensees outside of a meeting, do I have any questions? Scan. You'll have to raise your hand because I can't see you if you're nodding because we have no cameras. Okay, I don't see any. So let me just talk to you about what you do if you get these contacts outside of a meeting. I mean, it can be kind of shocking or difficult to know exactly what to do. So the best thing to do if you're contacted by someone is refer them to me so I can connect them with the correct 
staff member to assist them. They can call me on my cell, they can email me, either one is fine. If a consumer or a licensee is reaching out to you directly, it's likely they have already been in contact with board staff and they're looking for you to support them in whatever issue they're dealing with. This could be an investigation that's underway by our enforcement division, or it could be a deficiency that they're facing with their renewal application. But engaging in a conversation or some other form of communication outside of the meeting, that can create a conflict of interest for you. And that could result in you having to recuse yourself if the matter comes before the board or one of its committees. And despite the fact we use the board's address and the board's phone number on our public rosters, we all know with today's technology, it is quite easy for individuals to find your direct contact information through social media, the board's website, uh, or the internet. So if you're contacted by phone, it's best not to let the conversation go too far. Once you realize that the consumer or the licensee is contacting you because of your role on the board or a committee, I'd recommend you politely interrupt, give them my contact information, let them know you reach out to me and I'll call them. And if the contact is by mail, I'm sorry, by email, please, once you realize that it's from a consumer or a licensee, just stop reading it and then just forward it to me and by a letter in the mail, it's likely that others have received it as well, and I may already have a copy. So you can give me a call, we can discuss next steps, or you can just scan it and email it to me and I'll take it from there. Under no circumstances should you respond to emails or letters on your own. And if you're invited to join a call or a meeting by an outside organization or stakeholder, or if you're asked to speak on behalf of the board in any manner, it must be pre-approved. So please always call these situations through your program chief or just reach out to me directly. If you're contacted by an applicant regarding the status application, for example, or licensure, please direct those to me as well. I know that there are times when the processing of an application may impact a job offer or a promotion, so we want to make sure we give assistance where we can in these situations. So before I move on with uh, the next item, let me turn it back to President Savoy, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Patty. I appreciate that. Uh, last but not least, an overview and discussion regarding the best practices for virtual meetings. Ms. Oh, Deanna sorry, Pierce. I'm so sorry. I have one more. I just wanted to talk a bit about staff support, but I wanted to uh, make sure if there were questions that you had the opportunity to call on people. Yeah, I think uh, Ms. Tu. Uh, Patty, in, in the incidents with the mail, um, the, I did receive something and I believe everybody else did. And I made an assumption you already received it because it says CC and everything. Um, do you still want us to scan and send those letters to you, despite the fact that it was addressed to us as board member as well as staff? Yeah, great question. Usually when members get those in the mail, every member has received a copy, the department's received a copy, sometimes the governor's office. So if you get that in the mail, you can gladly scan it to me and give it to me, but you can also just give me a call or an email because I probably am already aware of it. And then I could just save you having to scan it. In, in most cases, I'll already have it. I'll tell you, just go ahead and shred it and you won't need to send it in. Thank you. Any Absolutely. All right, I'm sorry, handle number- uh, <laughs> No problem. Six, six. Thank you. Thank you, President Savoy. Okay, the next item I'd like to talk about is uh, staff's roles and responsibilities with su which support uh, chairs and vice chairs during our committees. So first, just make sure that for our new chairs and vice chairs or for any members that 
you're thinking about joining a leadership position, I just want you to know that you will not be left alone to figure out things on your own. Staff will be there to support and assistance every step of the way. So if you're following along in your materials today, there's a document highlighting staff support in relation to committee meetings. You also, also should have a copy of our board and committee roster, and that notes the staff member liaisons assigned to each of our committees. So far, three statutory committees, which include, as, as was mentioned earlier, the Qualifications Committee, the Enforcement Advisory Committee, and the Review Committee. Your assigned liaisons and management will draft the agenda for each of the meetings and then provide it to the chair for review. For the board's advisory committees and task force, which includes the Legislative Committee, the Committee on Professional Conduct, the Enforcement Program Oversight Committee, and then our newly established Experience Task Force, staff will work with President Savoy in drafting those agendas. Once approved internally, the agenda is reviewed and approved by the Department's Legal Counsel to ensure compliance with the Bagley Key Open Meeting Act. And as was noted earlier by Council, the agenda must be posted to the board's website 10 days prior to the meeting. But chairs and vice chairs, don't worry, you will not need to monitor timely posting of agendas. This is a function that is handled uh, directly by staff. Prior to each meeting, the assigned staff liaison will schedule a conference call with the chairperson to go over the upcoming agenda, provide a brief summary of the agenda items, and then answer any questions that you might have. Also, if there's anything that might be challenging or controversial on the agenda, staff will make sure to share that with you as well. The staff liaison will also prepare proposed talking points to assist the chair in facilitating the meeting and in providing their committee reports to the full board. But chairs and vice chairs, I welcome you to modify the talking points so that it is in your own personal presentation style. And I know the idea of facilitating a meeting might seem a bit intimidating to some, but we work really hard to make the job easy. It's our goal to make your time in the leadership, leadership position stress-free and enjoyable. So if there's anything additional we can do to assist you, then just ask. And then lastly, when in-person meetings resume, staff will secure the meeting locations and be available to assist with travel arrangements and expense reimbursements. And that concludes my presentation today. So let me turn it back to President Savoy and happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you, Patty. Excellent presentation as usual. Are there any questions so far? All right, Ms. Pierce. Thank you. Um, hoping that you can all hear me clearly. Um, the last item addresses virtual meeting best practices, and you should have received a copy of the most recent best practices, um, both for this meeting and I'm sure um, in your prior committee roles. But this document is a helpful guide for participants in CBA's virtual meetings. I just wanted to highlight a few items. Uh, one of the sections is on using the raise hand feature to speak during meetings. Um, and I think that's very valuable. So it'll um, ease uh, the control of the meetings and make sure that each member um, has an opportunity to speak and provide input, but in an orderly fashion. Um, another best practice is to have members to log in approximately 10 to 15 minutes early prior to the start of the meeting. Just to test audio and video, um, we do mic checks just to make sure everything is smooth so when the meeting starts, um, it can start on time. Um, cameras should be on during the entire meeting, except as uh, like right now when we're having some uh, bandwidth issues, then um, you need to adjust on the fly. Um, but turn, the break, turn your camera off during breaks and lunches, um, and then you can turn the camera back on when the meeting resumes. And we have provided uh, virtual backgrounds with the CBA logo. And this is um, really great to use. It, it creates some consistency for all of the members. 
Um, and it, you don't have to worry about blurring out the background or having a background that shows that you are attending a meeting from um, uh, somewhere on a beach. So it just has a professional tone to it as well. And if you need help setting that up, um, please reach out to staff and, and we can get that out to you. And then the last item I want to mention, it, it isn't in the best practices now, but we're going to be adding it in. For the EAC and the QC meetings, um, when the committee is in closed session, members must not have other individuals present. So when we meet in person, this is really easy to control because um, staff make sure the doors are closed and only those individuals who, can, who should be in closed session are in there. But when we're participating remotely, it's possible you may be in a location where others are present. Um, so in those instances, you just need to take steps to ensure confidentiality. So with that, um, I'll turn it back over to the president and I'm happy to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Any comments, questions, anybody? Any topic of anybody, for anybody? Uh, Ms. Corrigan. The boy, I just want to underscore um, something that Patty was saying about, um, you know, your service on an advisory committee, uh, your service on the board is meant to be something you enjoy. I certainly do it. It's extremely rewarding. And remembering that the staff do the legwork, they do the heavy lifting for us, but we have to be the ones that are front and center and brave that part of it. So just remember that you have a lot of support and I just encourage everybody to reach out and, and strive for that. The, ex the materials today were excellent and the presentations were really good and really helpful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Corrigan. Yeah, I echo that sentiment as well. This is my 12th year on the board. And without the staff, I wouldn't be what I am today. So I thank you all. Uh, if there are no further questions, I thank you all for being here. Hopefully this was rewarding. And uh, see you out there. Have a great weekend, everybody. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very informative. Watch for your survey, everyone. <laughs>